Welcome, everybody, to History at High Noon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Haley Aguirre. For those of you who don't know, I am archival records clerk at the Sioux City Public Museum. And today, I'm going to talk about the history of power companies in Sioux City. So essentially, the complex history web that is today mid-American energy. This all started back when uh, I asked Tom, hey, Tom, how did somebody in 1892 in Sioux City turn their lights on? And he thought for a second, and he was like, well, that depends. Is the house wired for electricity, or does it have gas service? And things just kind of spiraled from there. I uh, really had a lot of fun putting this talk together. Um, I just got fascinated by the history of how something like electricity, which at the time was a new invention and a luxury good, comes to something that we need every single day in our daily lives. And hopefully you find that history incredibly fascinating as well. So I do want to say a lot of information of this talk came from this book, The Service People by Bill Beck, uh, printed in 1991. Um, I am not a mechanical engineer. I am not an electrical engineer. I cannot tell you the ins and outs and mechanics of how all this stuff actually works. Um, Bill Beck can, and he can also tell you a lot of the complex uh, company history of the utility companies throughout Iowa. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, or if you know anything about electricity and utilities, definitely check this book out. I'm just here to give you a general overview and show pretty pictures. So before the power companies, the name of the game was light. Light was the main reason that power companies even got started and the main reason uh, for their formation. Before we had power companies, we were using things like oil lamps, oil lanterns, and even our brome carriage out there on display um, was using oil-based headlights, essentially, on the side of it. Um, if you didn't have oil-based uh, lamps or that kind of thing, you were kind of limited to what you could get done during the day, and oil lamps weren't very bright either. Um, so they weren't the best solution. So when these power companies are forming, they're mainly trying to get light, publicly available, readily available light um, to Sioux City and its citizens. So the first power company that I can talk about here in Sioux City is the Sioux City Gas Light Company. This formed in 1872 by all of these guys. And they had a gas works at First and Court Street, which you can see over there um, in that woodblock print. Now, I am a millennial. I was born in the 1990s, and I had never heard the term manufactured gas before I started researching this talk. So those of you who know what coal gas, town gas, or manufactured gas is, um, please bear with me for a minute, because I'm sure there are some people who don't know what coal gas is. Um, so the gaslight company is making manufactured gas. So they are bringing in coal from the rail lines that you can see up here, and that coal is stored in their coal house. It is then heated in something called a retort. A retort is a big chamber that doesn't have any oxygen in it. When you get coal really, really hot in a chamber that doesn't have oxygen, the coal doesn't actually burn. Instead, it breaks down into three major byproducts. Coke, which is incredibly important at this time for heating, and so furnaces at the time are running coke. Coal tar, which has its own uses in manufacturing and such. And coal gas, which is what these guys are using and collecting for light. The gas is collected, purified, and then put into a giant gas holder called a gasometer. That was that weird uh, chicken coop looking thing you guys saw on the last slide. It is then sent to a system of pipes uh, buried underground around Sioux City and then sent up to lights wherever it's needed to be. So if you didn't know what coal gas was, if you didn't know what manufactured gas was, that is what this is. We're not talking about natural gas yet. So Sioux City's very first street lights were gas street lights, and they were lit on St. Patrick's Day, 1873. Here you can see a shot of Pearl Street showing one of these gas lights very nicely. The gas comes up through the pole here and sticks up into the lantern. There's a knob on the side of that pipe that when you turn it, it releases that gas, just like a Bunsen burner. And then that gas is ignited by a guy called a lamp lighter. And that flame is what produces your light. Gas burns a lot brighter and a lot easier than oil lamps and such do. Um, so this gas was much, much better for Sioux City. 
You didn't have just gas exterior lights and street lights, though. You also had gas inside of buildings. Here you can see one inside of the Sioux City Commercial College on Jackson Street in about 1892. Same idea, gas comes down through the poles and then sticks up into those little glass bowls. Turn the knob, release the gas, light the gas, there's your light. Now for electricity, Sioux City's very first electric company was called the Sioux City Electric Light and Power Company. This formed in fall of 1883 and they had a small, and I mean a small, electric generating plant over on Pearl Street in an alley between 2nd and 3rd Street. They had one generator to power uh, electricity with. This went through several iterations until 1888 when it was eventually reorganized as the Sioux City Electric Company, and that's what I'm going to call it because that's a lot easier to say than electric light and power. So, Sioux City Electric Company. Sioux City's very first electric lights were lit on January 11th, 1884. These are lights both in the inside of buildings and shops, like the one in Hatton Back and McGee's grocery store on Pearl Street, and these were also attached to the outside of buildings. They had 40 lights, 36 of them actually lit, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, here you can see a list of everybody who has at least one electric light, um, and some of them have multiple, some of them have two, and the shoe lines even have three. And lights were turned on at 6 o'clock p.m. They turned half of them off at 10, just to make sure the current would adjust, which it did just fine. And then all electric lights were turned off at midnight, because what self-respecting Susidian would need light after midnight? So generators at this time period were called dynamos. And again, I mentioned Sioux City Electric Company only had one. A dynamo only produces direct current, meaning that any light that is being powered by that generator has to be plugged directly into that generator. This kind of limits where in Sioux City you can put lights. They have to be relatively close to the plant. The company's farthest light was installed down at Bogue's Meat Market at 4th and Virginia, which was six and a half blocks away. And I love this picture because you can actually see there is a gas light fixture hanging in the middle of this room but it's not being used. The light in the room is clearly coming from an electric bulb that is behind that hanging piece of meat there. In late 1884 and 1885, the company also furnished what I call hanging electric street lights. Uh, so these are lights that are put onto a wire that is stretched across an intersection and literally hanging down from that wire, like you can see here in this shot of 4th Street. Now, why hanging street lights? Well, they were a lot cheaper than the more familiar mast street lights, and they had to be cheap because these lights, electric lights, were all paid for by the businesses that were using them and residents living near the street lights. They weren't paid for by the city like the gas lights were. Now, why? Why didn't the city want to dive into this electric game? I mean, even at the time, electricity was brighter than gas lights and it was cheaper to make. I mean, that should be all you need, right? Well, there's a lot of complexity surrounding electricity at this time period. Number one, electricity was really unreliable. Um, I think the company went through seven different dynamos within its first couple months of operations. Uh, when the dynamos break, uh, we can't make parts here. Those parts have to come from Chicago, and until the parts get in and the generators get fixed, you don't have electricity. So it wasn't exactly a reliable way to produce light. Electricity was also pretty dangerous at this time period. All of Sioux City's street lights were uh, these arc lamps that you can see uh, on the left there. Arc lamps produce light by uh, essentially exploding carbon fibers. They burn very, very hot and they're very dangerous to change because they burn so hot. Um, they were using incandescents as well. These were mostly insides of buildings, uh, so on and so forth. So they were using incandescents, but street lights had to be arc lights because arc lights are brighter. Plus, electricity was just scary at this time period. I mean, it was borderline magic. Nobody knew how these little balls of glass produced light. Whereas with gas, turn a knob, gas comes out, gas lights on fire, fire makes light. That's much, much easier to understand. And gas was much more reliable as well. 
Um, so that's why the city wasn't really quite yet willing to jump on this electric train. The corn palaces of Sioux City did have electric lighting. They had private generators running electric lights inside the palace. And if you look really, really close on the main entrance here, you can even see one of those electric lights. The streets around the corn palaces were all lit with these terrifying looking gas light structures. So those, that is a system of gas pipes sticking up into these little bowls that you can see. And those bowls all have an open flame inside of them. And they're surrounding a building made out of dried grain. It is amazing Sioux City did not burn to the ground during the Corn Palace years. So in 1889, both the Sioux City Gaslight Company and the Sioux City Electric Company were taken over by a third-party Philadelphia company called United Gas Improvement, or UGI. They had a local guy on the ground, L.L. Kellogg, actually running things while they, uh, their business executives stay at, stayed out east. Now, I have hostile there in quotation marks because while I don't think this takeover was expected, nobody was really surprised. Sioux City was growing so fast in the 1880s, the electric and gas companies just could not keep up with demand. There are even articles at the time that call Sioux City the most wretchedly lighted city of its size on earth. So somebody had to come in and improve things for Sioux City citizens. And for Sioux City, it happened to be UGI. I do want to talk very briefly about Leonard Lamb Kellogg here because he is so, so important to this early days of utilities. Kellogg was an Ohio guy, and he came here to Sioux City in 1885 to work for the Sioux City Gas Light Company. That was his um, main background. Now, he was involved with Sioux City Power Utilities for over 40 years, and he was an integral part of these early formative years of electricity and gas starting to get more widely used and very much widely demanded by Sioux City and its citizens. Um, his obituary in 1925 even called Kellogg the last of the Mohicans, putting his name up there with people like John Pierce and Arthur Gerritsen, who helped build Sioux City from the ground up. Um, so Kellogg was extremely, extremely important in these early days of utilities. One of the first things UGI did after they took over was get rid of that tiny electric light plant and build a brand new plant right next to the gas works at First and Court Street. Now we have seven dynamos inside of this gas plant, so it's much, or inside of this electric plant rather. Um, so if one of them breaks, it's much easier to replace. We don't have to wait to, uh, for the lights to turn back on. Um, we have backup dynamos now. And here's a shot of the generating room in that brand new light plant. Um, electric generation worked very different in the 1880s than it does today, understandably. On the right here, you guys can see a bunch of coreless engines. These are powered by, I, I believe they're diesel engines. And they're actually turning belts that are going into the main generators here. Those generators spin, and that is how we get our electricity. This is very different how we do it today. Today we use steam power, um, but in the very early days of electricity, this was the standard. UGI also enlarged the gas plant right next to the electric plant. Uh, by the end of the expansion, they added another gasometer, and they could produce 3 million cubic feet of gas per month, which was easily over triple what they had been doing before that takeover. So after the expansion and after UGI takes control, we finally get a city-contracted uh, electric light for street lights. Uh, 70 new electric streetlights were installed downtown, and this picture showing the Davidson building is much later, um, but it gives you an idea of what these uh, streetlights look like, those arc lamps hanging down from this big mast pole. The gas streetlights that had been all over downtown were moved up to the neighborhoods, who were uh, really increasingly starting to demand um, lights for their streets and for their sidewalks. So here you can see one of those gas lights that had been downtown moved up outside the Florney House in Rose Hill. However, if you were living in Sioux City's neighborhoods, you did not have to be dependent on UGI for your electricity. Uh, a lot of the transit companies were starting to make electricity of their own in this time period. 
The Sioux City Cable Railway Company, which ran right up Jackson Street, had a powerhouse at 29th and Jones to power the cable car. That powerhouse had an electric light plant in its basement. So if you were living up on uh, Pierce's Edition in Sioux City in the 1890s, you didn't have to talk to those guys down at Court Street. You could get your power right here from the cable company, or from the cable railway. And by 1893, almost all of Sioux City streetcar systems were running on electricity. So if you were living near the powerhouses, like the Traction Company powerhouse at Second and Water, um, you could take advantage from the electricity that they produce for lights in your home. James Peavy, who was president of one of these major Sioux City uh, street railways, uh, had a house at 2805 Rebecca Street. Now I have scoured the images we have of the inside of Peavy's house and I cannot find a single gas powered light fixture. This would have been unthinkable in the 1890s, but darn it, his company produced electricity and he was going to take advantage of it in his house. So here you can see an electric light fi fi fixture, rather, in the Peavy house on Rebecca. Most Sioux City homes and businesses, like the Wissing and Anderson Jewelry Company you can see here, had fixtures that could utilize both gas or electricity depending on what was available and what was cheap at the time. So the gas lights, again, are these sticking up the top here, and the ones hanging down below have, glass, uh, have electric bulbs in them. So um, this was much more the norm for Sioux City at the time. Now, I can't talk a lot about this guy, but you cannot mention electricity in Sioux City without talking about H.O. Woodruff. Woodruff was an electrician from out east, and he came here to Sioux City in 1890 to light our Corn Palace. This here is a display that was on the 1890 Corn Palace made by Woodruff. That same year, he started the Sioux City Electrical Supply Company, which was a retail company that sold electric devices and suited electric needs. Now, what do I mean by devices? Well, the big thing Sioux City Electrical Supply made was generators and generator parts. So now, number one, uh, UGI, the UGI company down on Court Street doesn't have to order their parts in from outside anymore. They can be made right here in Sioux City by Woodruff's company. Some of the bigger businesses can also buy their own generators and generate electricity themselves rather than buying it from a third party. But probably most importantly, Sioux City Electrical Supply sold electric devices for the home. Fans, lamps, light bulbs, telegraph keys, doorbells, even burglar alarm systems. The more and more people that buy these uh, home conveniences, the more demand for electricity increases. So this spells great news for the power company. Here you can see a shot on Fifth Street showing Sioux City Electrical Supply along with this beautiful hanging arc lamp right there. Um, right next to it was Interstate Electric. Uh, this would later become McGraw Electric, which gained national uh, fame uh, for a locally based company. And there were lots and lots of other electrical supply companies that popped up all around Sioux City and kept popping up throughout the century. And I can't talk about all of them, uh, but know that these go hand in hand uh, with the electricity and all of those conveniences that we see from the power companies. Oop. Finally, in 1901, UGI actually combined both the gas company and the electric company into one brand new company, Sioux City Gas and Electric. Now this was still subject to UGI. UGI held it as a holding company and kept L.L. Kellogg as the guy on the ground actually making the plants function and making the lights work. Here you can see a shot of the newly formed Sioux City Gas and Electric Company in about 1905, right outside their works on Court Street. Now some specs of how this company was doing in the early 1900s, I'm not gonna read all these, um, but one cool thing is that they have gas stoves, over 5,000 gas stoves in service by 1904. Gone are the days of the old uh, pot belly coal-fired and wood-fired stoves. Um, now you can use a gas range, not only for cooking, but for heating your home. To uh, because gas use is increasing so much, they had to lay uh, new wider gas mains um, along Sioux City, and that's what you see happening here on Court Street in about 1905. 
Electricity is doing very well as well. By 1904, they had 11 generators, 400 arc lamps, and 20,000 incandescent bulbs. Now, starting in the early 1900s, you, see, you start to see these campaigns and pushes by local groups to try to convince the city government to create a municipal light plant. That way, electric bills could be paid for by things like taxes instead of as a separate bill to a separate company. Now, the city never did this, obviously. We're still under Mid-American today. Um, and there was really no incentive for the city to do it uh, because they got great breaks from the company for their electric usage. Um, but if you look in papers at this time period, you're going to see these campaigns going on and on and on throughout the century. Here you can see a shot of the construction of a brand new gasometer that was built between 1906 and 1908. This one's made of steel. It had a capacity over one of one million cubic feet, which is absolutely gigantic. And I love this picture because you're looking out over the intersection of Grand Avenue, which is today Gordon Drive, and Iowa Street. And all of these houses are part of a neighborhood that would one day be called the South Bottoms, that working class neighborhood, um, largely home to the uh, people who work in the meatpacking plants of Sioux City. And here's a shot of the huge completed gasometer with its steel sides. The uh, gas, por uh, gas holding portion is in the middle of that steel wall there. Here's a little more updated shot of how Sioux City Gas and Electric's uh, plant building looked in the teens. We've replaced those horses and carriages with motorized vehicles for our meter men. And Really, by the 19-teens, we're starting to finally see electricity and power as something that is not a luxury, but an absolute necessity. As necessary as clothing, meat, or groceries, so Judge J.L. Kennedy said here in 1909. We have a lot more devices and a lot more inventions that people are really, really hungry for. Again, I've mentioned fans and light bulbs already, but now we have electric irons, our very first electric ranges, gas water heaters, which is what you can see up in the corner there, electric toasters, and the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, so all of this new technology, all of this new stuff um, are really creating more demand for electricity uh, as well as gas here in Sioux City. This is a shot of the Sioux City Gas and Electric offices as they were at this time period. These were in the commercial block on Pierce Street. And in their display window, you can see a couple more of their products that they're selling, not only lamps, but electric coffee kettles for making coffee. And of course, that beautiful arc lamp street light in the middle. Throughout the early teens, uh, Sioux City hit another huge growth period, and Sioux City Gas and Electric made over $45,000 worth of improvements to their Court Street plants, both the electric and gas side. Those old belt-driven generators are now replaced with these turbo-generating units, 1,600 horsepower, and you can see that here inside of the plant. These turbo, turbo generators allow the plants to produce alternating current, which is much easier to produce and much easier to transport. AC is mostly what electric plants would use throughout the century. Now, for AC, you need transformers to change the voltage, and so these huge transformers were installed on the site in about 1915. To run these turbines, we need steam power. So a boiler system was installed that heated coal um, and that hot coal boiled water into steam. The steam was then piped to those turbines, and uh, the turbine generators inside spin those turbines around, and that is how we generate our electricity. This is essentially uh, how electricity is still generated today, uh, though this is just on a much smaller scale. Now, a boiler system utilized the wells that were on site of the gas and electric company, and every now and then you had to flush the system to uh, keep everything working properly. And when they did that, all of this warm water comes flooding out of the plant and onto the side. And it's great fun for the neighborhood kids who come and play in it. Just some other shots of the equipment inside of these plants. This is their electric switching and meter unit. 
And here is the piping system, these pipes carrying, again, steam for the turbines, as well as that gas, manufactured gas. Also in the teens, Sioux City Gas and Electric started moving lines underground rather than having them carried in poles up above. That meant the removal of this scary looking thing called the crow's nest, which is right outside of their plants. This is a switching pole that uh, transfers currents from one set of lines to another set of lines. Um, the switching unit was moved underground. Now in this post-war uh, World War I era, Sioux City Gas and Electric starts to struggle for a little bit, little bit, really for the first time in the company's history since UGI. Now we have a post-war boom that's generating a lot more energy as people have more money to, to spend and more devices are getting made. Workers are also demanding higher wages and they're encouraged to do so by Sioux City's very vehement pro-labor government led by Mayor Wallace M. Short here. That city is also keeping pressure on the gas and electric company to keep prices low. And this is all exacerbated by the astronomical cost of materials. There were several strikes from coal workers in the 19-teens, the worst one in 1919, where over half of the country's coal miners simply refused to work. Um, so there was a few years there where Sioux City Gas and Electric had to, op had to operate at a loss because coal was so expensive. To help curtail these losses, in 1922, Sioux City Gas and Electric purchased the Sioux City Service Company. This was the name of the company that was running Sioux City streetcars at the time. Now, not only do they get all the revenue that the streetcar system produces, but they get control of their big electric power plant and car barn down at 2nd and Water Streets. So now they have two power plants. To distinguish the two of them, they dubbed this station on Water Street Kirk Station after the Sioux City Service Company president, uh, E.L. Kirk. The Kellogg Street Station was renamed, to, or, or the Kellogg Street, gosh, sorry, the Court Street Station was renamed Kellogg Station after L.L. L. Kellogg. And I don't know if it was ever actually called that because you consistently see it as Court Street, but there is a substation right at the intersection of Court and Gordon Drive today that still bears Kellogg's name. Here's a shot inside Kirk Station in the 1920s with all those nice turbine generators. Now, Kirk Station um, often needed more water than its wells on site could provide. So they built this little pump house that they dubbed the Water Street Navy to take water out of the Missouri River and pump it into the boilers. Now, if you know anything about the Missouri River, it is extremely muddy. And so this caused absolutely disastrous clogs within uh, Kirk Station's pipes. So the Water Street Navy was not utilized for very long. But what Sioux City really, really needed to help curtail these losses was a brand new, gigantic, state-of-the-art power plant. So in 1924, UGI approved plans for a site in Riverside right along the Big Sioux River. I will be calling this power plant Big Sioux. Cost just shy of $4 million, and it was finally complete in June of 1925. Most of the construction was overseen by this guy, W.J. Burtke, who became president of Sioux City Gas and Electric after uh, Kellogg retired. Some specs on Big Sioux for the curious. I'm not going to read all these, but it had two giant turbo generators, each one producing 10,000 kilowatts of electricity at max load. Originally, it had two smokestacks, each 140 feet tall and 8 feet in diameter. They're still under construction in this picture, but those are right there. Big Sioux uh, employed 44 workmen at the start of its operations in 1927. Or 1925, gosh, sorry. Big Sioux was the third plant in the country to utilize coal powdered by its own mills. Uh, before this, we had to get crushed coal that was crushed off-site and then uh, order it in. Here, they could crush their own coal, so they could buy just coal by itself, stored in a big coal yard, and crush it on-site. Big Sioux's pulverizers could grind six tons of coal per hour. Expansions to Big Sioux were done in just a couple years later in 1927, and then again in 28 and in 1932. Some of the improvements made during these expansions include a fourth boiler, the steam drum of which you guys uh, can see right here, 
uh, being ridden on by this guy who's very clearly never heard of OSHA. <laughs> um, and there was another turbo generator installed at Big Sioux during these expansions as well. Here's a shot of Big Sioux's turbine room. As I mentioned, each turbo generator can produce 10,000 kilowatts at max load or max capacity. You'll hear me say that term a lot when I talk about power plants and generators. This is essentially just a term for what that generator or plant can produce when it's running at full capacity. They don't run at full capacity all the time because that's expensive and inefficient, but that's how much they could run. It's just a way to measure um, power plant efficiency. Here you can see Big Sue's water pumps and very complex system of steam pipes to connect the boilers and the turbines. So what is Sioux City Gas and Electric looking like in 1925? Well, their general offices have moved to the Commerce Building, getting great advertising from all those electric lights on the side. Gas sales are actually down. More and more people are buying into this electricity thing. So gas sales are kind of down, um, but electricity is way, way up. And now, thanks to Big Sue, we can keep up with that demand. They're making just shy of $1 million in annual revenue, so the company's sitting pretty well for itself. Here's a shot of the first floor of the Commerce Building where the sales department was for the company. Um, some of the uh, devices I've mentioned before, again, you have your toasters, you have your lamps, um, but we start seeing new devices in this time period as well. We have our first refrigerators, ice boxes. This uh, thing right here is called a mangle, which I had never heard of before I did this talk. A mangle is a giant iron, for those who don't know, and you can see some water heaters in the back, fans, uh, so on and so forth. And here is some meter men in uniform outside of the Commerce Building in about 1920. These are the guys who are going around reading all the meters and figuring out how much to charge people for their electricity and gas. Now, Big Sioux was a really big deal, not only because it meant more electricity for Sioux City, but because it gained the attention of this guy, Iowa power magnate George Neal. Neil was from Missouri, and he came to Iowa in 1925 after working for numerous plants, all owned by UGI. In 1926, George Neal created the Iowa Public Service Company, or IPS, by consolidating multiple Iowa power companies here in North and Eastern Iowa. He moved IPS headquarters, uh, by the way, IPS at the time still under UGI, it's operating under UGI, UGI is its holding company. He moved IPS headquarters from Fort Dodge here to Sioux City to be closer to Big Sioux. And very confusingly, he also became general manager of Sioux City Gas and Electric Company. So one guy is running two separate companies, IPS and Sioux City Gas and Electric, and running those companies separately until they merge in 1949. And I'll talk about how that happened a little bit later in the talk. Neil Foley retired in 1966, and he died in 1969. One of the very first things George Neal did after coming to Sioux City was built a massive transmission line from Big Sioux Power Plant out to Rutland, Iowa, which is near Humboldt. The, there were power stations all along this transmission line that could ferry out power all across northwestern Iowa to its small towns, um, so on and so forth. And this became really the backbone of IPS West distinguished from IPS each, East, which had its main power plant over in Waterloo. Now, it's important to note that whenever I talk about IPS, um, I'm talking about not so much a company as much as a giant system that has many districts and many subsidiary companies. And it's really complicated, and I don't like talking about it. Um, but I can't talk about IPS's pan-Iowa influence. I can really only talk about their uh, impact here in Sioux City. But just know that there's a lot more going on behind the woodwork. Back here in Sioux City in 1927, we get construction of the service building for Sioux City Gas and Electric at Dace and Iowa Streets, still there. Uh, here you can see it nearing completion in 1927. The service building was built to house um, various things like company offices, warehouse storage, there was a repair shop for equipment, as well as a garage for the company's vehicles. Um, I do believe it is still in use in some capacity by Mid-American Energy. Um, it's that big 
red clad building down uh, on the southern edge of downtown with that big welcome to Sioux City sign on it. Um, I don't know exactly how it's being used, but Mid-American still owns it and I believe it's still being used somehow. Ah, finally, the gas I'm more familiar with, natural gas. So natural gas first came to Iowa in 1929 with the construction of the A-Line by the Northern Natural Gas Company. This took natural gas from their fields down in Kansas and Texas all the way up to Ogden, Iowa, and then a fork down to Des Moines. So that's the A-Line right here, this diagonal line there. In 1931, Sioux City Gas and Electric contracted with Northern Natural Gas to make a line up through Nebraska to give Sioux City natural gas service. So that's this line right through here. Um, in 1932, Big Sioux was converted to a three fuel system that could burn coal, natural gas, or fuel oil, which is a petroleum product, depending on what was available at the time and, of course, what was cheap. Now, how do we get the natural gas to Sioux City? Well, they actually laid our first natural, pipe, uh, natural gas pipeline right on top of the old Missouri River Railroad Bridge. This is a shot of the construction of the brand new bridge in 1980, the one that's still there. Um, but on the old bridge, you can even see that natural gas pipeline running right along top of it. Now, it's important to note that at the time, this natural gas is only coming to Big Sioux and down to the meat packers. We don't start seeing natural gas in homes yet. That comes a little bit later. <laughs> um, so the 1930s come, and of course we have the Great Depression, and Sioux City Gas and Electric and IPS really fared the depression pretty well. There was a small dip in sales in 32 and 33, but countywide, electricity sales were up throughout the decade. They even had a retail campaign called Better Light for Better Sight, where they were pushing their gas and electric products. The biggest thing was that prices for consumers stayed low. George Neal was absolutely adamant about this. Um, no matter how his company had to run, the price points for consumers were going to stay low. And this really built up some loyalty for both of George Neal's companies. Here you can see a shot of uh, the IPS sales floor in 1935 showing some more electrical devices. I love this picture because you see more the more you look at it. Uh, of course, we had the vacuum cleaners and the refrigerators and ranges, which I've already mentioned. But you also have over here washing machines and clothes dryers. You have hair dryers, men's razors, and even hot plates for your kitchen, as well as those uh, coffee kettles that you can see down here. A lot of you should recognize this guy, old Reddy Kilowatt, who was electricity's national mascot. He'd been used on uh, utility promotional materials across the United States, and he had first appeared here in Sioux City in 1937. Reddy, Reddy Kilowatt was once a prominent feature of the big lighted sign that was on the Sioux City ser uh, that was on the service company building. Um, here you can see it when it's part of IPS. That sign was put up in '57. And Reddy and the blue natural flame of uh, natural gas, and as well as other parts of the sign, were removed in 1996. However, that Welcome to Sioux City portion is still on there. I think it's been changed a couple times. But um, By the 1940s, Riverside was really getting sick of all of the soot and ash and gunk that was floating over their neighborhood because of Big Sioux. And so the company installed this giant 300-foot smokestack to help alleviate river, Riverside from that gunk. Coincidentally, it was dedicated December 7, 1941, and later dubbed the Pearl Harbor Smokestack. Throughout uh, World War II, both Sioux City Gas and Electric and IPS were avid participants in the home front. They encouraged the buying of war bonds, uh, things like victory gardens, as well as participating in public brownouts, which is kind of like a blackout where instead of electricity being turned off, it's just limited to consumers for a set amount of time. George Neal is quoted as saying in 1941, there is no escape from responsibility and there is no substitute for duty. Okay, so I mentioned I was going to talk about how these two merged. So when IPS and Sioux City Gas and Electric officially came together in 1949, this was part of a decades-long battle that utility companies were having with the federal government to try to break up these massive, massive companies like UGI. 
So throughout the 20s and 30s, these companies bounced around to a bunch of different smaller holding companies until finally they were free from holding company ownership. There was a big reorganization process until 1949 where the two finally merged under the name Iowa Public Service. Total reorganization of the company went on into the 1960s, but when people remember IPS um, or Iowa Public Service here in Sioux City, it has its roots here in this 1949 merger. Here you can see some of the big men in charge of the brand new IPS company, Warren Kane. Ernie Ron here became president after George Neal retired in the 60s. George Neal himself, Ed Roish, and C.E. Murphy. Now, with a new company, they wanted new office space. So in 1948, IPS signed a lease with the Francis Orpheum Company, who was in control of the Francis Building and the Orpheum Building. They helped to finance four additional floors to be added to the Orpheum Building so they could move their offices into there. And by 1961, IPS occupied over half of the Orpheum Building's office space. The Orpheum housed IPS offices for over 30 years, and uh, the building was even dubbed the Orpheum Electric Building because of the utilities company's presence inside it. The front entrance on Pierce Street, by the way, still bears the name Orpheum Electric Building if you look really, really close. This sign is hard to see unless you're standing right under it, but it is still called the Orpheum Electric Building. And here's a shot of IPS workers inside of their office space in about 1955. And a shot of the front reception counter in 1963, where people go to pay their electric bills and gas bills. I keep saying electric, but they're running gas too. At least they were running gas until 1950. <laughs> um, in 1950, IPS announced that um, it was going to officially end manufactured gas service. Now, it didn't just shut off in 1950. Um, this took several, several years, and I think it was, wasn't complete until closer into the 1960s. Um, now, at the time of this announcement, 25,000 gas customers in Sioux City were still using manufactured gas and IPS had to replace over 55,000 appliances that were using manufactured gas and convert them either to electricity or natural gas. Most of them are converted to natural gas. The last gasometer down at Kellogg Station was demolished between 1957 and 1958. So with all these new appliances, there's a lot more demand for natural gas, and so IPS helped finance the building of this big pipeline bridge, which went across the Missouri River and ended at uh, near where Big Sioux Terminal is today. Now, this bridge was removed sometime in the 2000s. I think, in effect, the pipe is still there. It's just been buried underground, and I think it kind of forks off into the Southern Hills area now. Um, but the bridge itself was removed sometime in the 2000s. I tried to nail down the exact date, and I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. In 1951, Kirk Station down on Water Street got a complete overhaul. Brand new turbines were installed, new meter units. Um, I think even some of the boilers were totally replaced. Um, so they got a brand new update in 1951. Just in time to get flooded by the Missouri flood of 1952. During that big flood, the Big Sioux River backed up and completely surrounded Big Sioux Power Plant, and workers had to build little wooden catwalks, which I think you can even see one of them right there, that were sticking up above the water so they could get access to the plant and keep it running until the waters died down. And just a year later, we had the Floyd River flood. This caused massive damage to Kellogg Station, as well as uh, the service building and several major gas mains. Total damage to the whole IPS system along the Floyd uh, totaled about $75,000. But IPS is going to be OK, because the 50s and 60s are huge, huge decades for electricity. There was a huge electric boom in this time period. Um, and to give you an idea just how huge, in 1959, the IPS system hit a record peak for electricity production with 202,700 kilowatts. By 1963, they were producing that much electricity every single hour. The main culprits, forced air heating and at-home air conditioning, the only thing that makes an Iowa summer bearable. 
Now you're not running electricity just during the winter when you need your furnace to go, but you're running electricity year round to keep the, air, uh, to keep the AC going. Um, so this puts a lot more strain on power plants. You also have a huge building boom in Sioux City in this time period, Sunnyside, those houses in Southern Morningside, and later on Indian Hills. All those houses are getting built with brand new state-of-the-art forced air systems and air conditioners and creating a lot more electricity usage. And let's not forget all the electricity going on downtown either, not just in the manufacturing centers to run lights and machines, but all of these lovely lighted signs that you see all along 4th Street and around our business district. Um, so Sioux City's using a lot of electricity in this time period. And so we need a gigantic new power plant. In the late 1950s, IPS purchased a site in the south of Sioux City uh, on a site that we today call Port Neal. They started construction of a brand new power plant in 1961, and they dubbed this plant George Neal Station. I will be calling this plant Neal One because shortly after it was complete, three more uh, power plants were built on the site, all named Neals Two, Three, and Four. So some specs on the new Neal Station. Again, I'm not going to read all of these, but it went online at Leap Day, 1964, um, cost. $23.6 million and had a capacity that was rated for a population of 200,000. That is several Sioux cities. Um, its huge boilers could burn 70, 75,000 gallons of water per minute, yet everything was run by only 30 employees. Thank you, automation. A little bit as to how Neal Station actually works. So the conveyor system takes coal from the coal yard through a series of crushers and that coal is going into the plant at 500 tons per hour. These big storage bins at the center uh, are really, really big, and they could, uh, they could burn 1,400 tons of coal per day through the plant. That coal goes into a furnace where it's heated by these three big cyclone burners. Once the coal's heated, it heats up water, and that water is carried through pipes down to the turbines. Speaking of the turbines, here is uh, Neal Station's giant turbine generator, 83 feet long and 500 tons. There's a big concrete pedestal that this thing sits on top of inside the building just to support its weight. Again, much of Neal One's systems are automated. However, on site there was always a team of chemists to check the boiler water and make sure no corrosions and no deposits would develop in the systems. In 1969, we had the construction of the RON substation, named after E.M. RON. This had a massive transformer unit to take power that was produced at Neal Station all across the IPS system. Just a few years after the completion of Neal 1, they started work on Neal 2 in 1969. This plant burns coal only, not a combo of coal and natural gas. By this point, IPS had purchased some coal mines out in Wyoming. And so coal was nice and cheap for them to ship into here to Sioux City. Even bigger, 310,000 kilowatt capacity and an even bigger generator to keep up with it. The smokestack on Neil 2 also had an electrostatic precipitator, which would catch fly ash and soot and all that gunk that comes from burning coal and collect it for further use. This was some of the first green energy uh, initiatives pushed forward by IPS. And right on the heels of Neil 2, we have Neil 3. Neil 3 was built between 1973 and 1975. This was the first jointly owned power plant by IPS, so IPS was mainly responsible for it, though there were other investors, other utility companies that were utilizing Neil 3 as well. Another coal only plant, even bigger at 516,000 kilowatt capacity. Here you can see Neil 3 smokestack and its generator, uh, or its generator, yeah, smokestack and generator. That smokestack, by the way, is uh, also built with another electrostatic precipitator that can catch all that fly ash and gunk. So when all three Neils were completed, they could produce 1 million kilowatts of electricity at max load. They cost the company around $713 million. As plans went underway for Neil 4, this complex became known as, as Neil North, and it's still called that today. 
Speaking of Neil Four or Neil South, uh, from 1976 to 1979, IPS built this gigantic power plant on a site south of the other Neils. Um, I cannot explain to you how stupidly huge this power plant is. I mean, like even seeing it from the interstate doesn't fully do it justice. Um, again, I, I mentioned one million kilowatt capacity for Neils one, two, and three combined. This guy is doing over half that by itself. And there have been so many additions and updates to Neil 4 put on throughout the years um, that it's running even better than that today. Here you can see a shot of Neil 4's uh, uh, coal conveyor system getting built. Neil 4 is cool because it can actually accommodate a full 110 cars and a coal train. And I think it's actually bigger now. I think it's 130 cars. Um, but at the time of its construction, these trains delivered 10,000 tons of coal to the plant three times a week. There are seven coal silos on Neil South, and these feed into the gigantic boiler building that you can see getting built on the right there. That boiler burns 367 tons per hour. Here you can see the precipitator for Neil South. Um, it had one just like Neil's two and three did. That fly ash and all that gunk is collected, and then it's sold off by the company. Fly ash is really important for making things like concrete. Um, so they're not just getting rid of it, they're actually selling it off. And here is the control room of Neil 4 during their open house shortly after completion in 1979. The pipe network of Neil South as well as the gihugic turbine that you can see there. And shortly after the Neils were built, um, IPS built a brand new building for themselves here in Sioux City at 4th and Douglas Streets. Um, so this building was to serve as IPS's brand new system control center, its data processing center, its communications division, as well as its corporate offices. So this was a big building that had to serve multiple purposes. Here's a shot of the system control center inside of that 4th and Douglas building. IPS spent over a third of the uh, building's budget just on brand new technology, most of it going to this control center, though quite a bit of it in communications as well. The atrium of the 4th and Douglas building actually has active and, polar, uh, active and passive solar heating inside of its windows. So this building, despite being so big, is actually pretty efficient to heat and cool down. Shortly after this building was complete, IPS raised prices on electric rates by almost 20%. They cited the uh, new power plant they had just built down in Ottumwa as the reason, though people all looked with sketchy eyes at their brand new shiny building here in Sioux City. Uh, widespread process came out of this, mostly because Iowans were already struggling under the farm crisis and the eastern oil embargoes. Um, so an agreement was eventually reached, but IPS's reputation was forever tarnished. And shortly after that, we have a tornado that struck Port Neal in 1986, caused damage to all the plants, and completely obliterated Neal 4's coal carrying system. Cleanup and repair took several months and cost the company over $25 million. Okay, more crazy management things. So I've been glossing over a lot of the complex business history of IPS simply because it's confusing and I don't like talking about it. Um, just know that since the 1960s, IPS is involved in something called power pooling, which is a, essentially an interconnected system of utilities and uh, network companies to create what we now know as the national grid. Uh, so here you can see the Iowa pool or the Iowa power grid in 1964. Throughout the decades, IPS is also buying a lot of companies and partnering with a lot of companies. And some of the companies it has bought are forming their own companies and buying their own companies. It's a mess, as I'm sure you can see from the chart on the right there. Um, so later on in the 1980s, IPS under starts, uh, starts undergoing a massive, massive series of changes to consolidate this mess. And it's really confusing, and I don't like to talk about it. So the shortest version ever, in 1983, IPS stopped being IPS and became a whole bunch of other stuff. Until 1995, when that whole bunch of other stuff eventually resulted in a mid-American energy. 
Now, MidAmerican underwent many other changes throughout the 1990s, but again, that's complicated and I don't want to talk about it. So MidAmerican, as we know it, essentially formed in 1995. In that confusing mess, one of those companies that came out of that confusing mess was called Midwest Energy Company. It was a parent company of IPS, and the only reason I'm talking about them at all is because these guys are the ones who started Dakota Dunes in 1989. Russ Christensen, who was head of the company, wanted to uh, build a new neighborhood that could help uh, build load on the system, and South Dakota offered him a great deal as far as tax incentives. And so that's how the neighborhood of Dakota Dunes got started back in those times. Dakota Dunes is, of course, much bigger um, than those early stages, and it continues to grow to this day. So MidAmerican moved their corporate offices down to Des Moines to be more centrally located in their wider service area. Uh, since 2000, MidAmerican has operated as part of Berkshire Hathaway. And the Sioux City branch still had offices here, still in the 4th and Douglas building until 2021. And now we all use that lovely kiosk out front to pay our electric bills. Or you do it online. Now starting in the 2010s, we start seeing a lot more state and federal regulations with regards to how much pollution coal-fired power plants are producing. So to help uh, keep in, uh, coincide with these new regulations, MidAmerican Energy put in pollution control units on NEO 3 and NEO 4. Now, these units were far too expensive to try to install on NEOs 1 and 2, and NEOs 1 and 2 were kind of obsolete and inefficient anyway, so NEOs 1 and 2 have been shut down. They're still there, um, and NEO 3 still operates, um, but only NEO th NEOs 3 and 4 are operating in Port NEO today. And in recent years, MidAmerican has made many more strides to increase renewable energy in its service area, funding solar farms, those lovely uh, wind farms we see along the Highway Tunney Corridor, and so on and so forth. And that is essentially a long web of complicated history of how for 150 years, Sioux City and its citizens turned their lights on. Thank you guys so much for coming, and I'm happy to take any questions.